Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Daniel Matura, and I am the co-chair of the CAA Arts Access Committee, a graduate of Columbia College class of 2009. I want to welcome you all to today's program, uh, Inside the Reopening of Broadway, and this will be a conversation with Lynn Nottage, Douglas Lyons, and Antoinette Nwandu. Today's program is part of Columbia Reflects, which is a series of events to reflect on what we've experienced and consider the present moment and look forward with hope towards what lies ahead. Uh, so as we look at the reopening of Broadway, we're in a totally different world after the pandemic. And we have an absolutely amazing slate of plays, uh, several of which and musicals, which have already opened. And today's conversation, uh, we want to talk to uh, these three playwrights uh, about their work, about their plays, uh, about their view about Broadway's reopening and engage them in a conversation uh, about coming back to Broadway and bringing audiences back. Uh, and again, with, with hope and excitement and affirmation for uh, what lies ahead. So now I will introduce our speakers. Uh, Lynn Nottage is a playwright and screenwriter and the first woman in history to win two Pulitzer Prizes for drama. Her plays have been produced widely in the United States and throughout the world and include Floyd's, Sweat, Malima's Tale, By the Way, Meet Vera Stark, Ruined, Intimate Apparel, and many others. Uh, her musical librettos include The Secret Life of Bees and MJ, which is also coming up on Broadway. Lynn is a recipient of the MacArthur Genius Grant Fellowship and is an associate professor at Columbia University School of the Arts. Her play Clyde's will premiere at Second Stage Theater on November 3rd, and MJ premieres in December. Uh, and so for all of these dates and for more information about the shows, we'll be sharing in the chat. Uh, and you can also find information from the Zoom website uh, as, I, as I say them. Uh, our next panelist is Douglas Lyons. He's an award-winning actor, director, composer, lyricist, and teacher. His writing for television includes Fraggle Rock, which is on Apple TV. And his theater credits include Off-Broadway Alliance winning Polka Dots at the Atlantic Theater Company, Bo, and Five Points. His acting credits on Broadway include Beautiful, part of the original cast, and The Book of Mormon. Uh, his play Chicken and Biscuits will debut on Broadway on September 23rd in two days at the Circle in the Square Theater. And finally, Antoinette Nwandu is a New York-based writer for stage, television, and film. Her play Passover reopened Broadway on August 4th after making its New York debut at Lincoln Center in 2018. The filmed version of the 2017 Steppenwolf production was directed by Spike Lee and premiered at the Sundance Film Festival and South by Southwest and is now streaming on Amazon Prime. Antoinette is a McDowell Fellow, an Ars Nova Playgroup alum, a Dramatist Guild Fellow, and Eugene O'Neill Playwrights Conference Literary Fellow. She has won the Paula Vogel Playwriting Award, Lorraine Hans Hansberry Playwriting Award, and Negro Ensemble Company's Douglas Turner Award Prize. Passover is now playing at the August Wilson Theater through August, uh, October 10th, October 10th, uh, which I um, encourage you all to see that, that play which reopened Broadway. So speaking about the reopening of Broadway is exactly, uh, where I want to start our conversation. And as we have three incredible playwrights here, and three playwrights, which I want to say uh, from the start, represent such a variety of writing styles and inspirations and genre and tone and journey that uh, they take audiences on, which I think is incredibly exciting. So as you know, as part of this panel, what we have is such a broad array of creativity here with us, which is really exciting. And it's such an honor to have to have you all in conversation. So I wanted to start because it's been so many months, it's been 18 months, um, and talk about what you as a writer think about the journey that you want to take audiences on. And what I'm getting at here is remind us the, the, the journey of theater when we go and sit there and what you want us to feel, what you want us to experience, what you as a writer can do with that experience. Because as I read in your bios, um, you all have experience in TV and film. And so theater, uh, remind us of that joy and that inspiration uh, as we 
as we all go back. And maybe we'll start with Antoinette because your play is open and you opened Broadway. So, so, so tell us. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I have to speak, yeah, from, from experience, from, from August 3rd, actually, when we had our invited dress. What I know that audiences have experienced and what I want audiences to continue experiencing, and this is true of every show, it's the experience of community. Before the show, you might come by yourself, you might come with one other person, you might come with four people, whatever. But when you give your ticket and you walk into the theater with your mask on, after having given your vaccination card and everything else that the theater asks you to do, you do. And then you are invited to a space that none of us has really been in for the last 18 months, which is the formation of a new community. Because when you experience a narrative together with strangers, Everybody knows this, but we've forgotten it. We remember it in our bodies. The first time the entire audience gasps together, you are community. You laugh together, you clap together. And we have not had that for a year and a half and our bodies miss it. And so yes, our actors who are now our frontline healers are going to go on stage and tell you a story that you need we need community, we need one another, and we need to experience narrative together. We need to breathe the same air, we need to laugh together, we need to cry together. That is why theater is back. And it's back on Broadway, it's back off Broadway, it's back off off Broadway, and sometimes it's even back on Zoom. If you're not ready to come in, stay home and still be a part of the new communities that are being made in every theater. That's what theater is and that's why we're back. That's it. Also Passover is, is, you know, Passover is playing. And specifically for my show, what I want people to experience is the idea of what the world would look like if black joy were centered. The black joy that these two men, the, 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 the climax of my play is a hug between two black men who survived every attempt to extinguish their lives. That's the climax of the play. The sun rises on the utopia and these two black men hug. That's the climax. That's what I want you to come see. I don't want you to see a story anymore. And I myself have given you older versions of the story where the climax was a lynching. It was. And I don't regret that story. I needed to tell that story. We needed to see that story because we were during the Trump administration. We needed to be purged as an audience. But now I cannot give you the same medicine for a new ill. What we need now is community and the vision of joy because without a vision, the people perish. And so you need to come and see black joy. And you need to come and see who gets into the promised land when black joy is centered. Is Asa for the villain by the end of this new version? That's my question, I ask you. So that's what theater means to me and that's what I want people to see and know. Thank you. That's, that's fantastic, thank you for that. And I wanna send that to, to Doug actually next. Um, this question about community and joy um, because Chicken and Biscuits is set in a church and there is a sense of family. So I would love to ask um, Doug to build on that in the sense of community and the community being built on stage and the community of, of those audiences. For sure. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, this is an honor to be alongside all these amazing playwrights. Um, during COVID, while sitting inside in this room where I did my writer's room and wrote plays and, and tried to keep myself above water, it hit me that part of the reason theater does not reach the masses is because of the stories we actually put on stage. And a lot of the stories we put on stage center a very specific demographic, you know? And so Chicken and Biscuits specifically takes the joy of three different generations of black women and puts it center stage. It takes 
their trauma, it takes their secrets, it takes their bereavement, it takes their laughter, and it squeezes all of those emotions into this play and allows and hopefully invites black people to come into this very white space and go, our stories belong. Our ratchet little cousin belongs. Our really loud auntie belongs. Our very uptight Christian mother belongs. Our queer son belongs in this space. And so I think coming back after this social uprising that we've had, we have a true opportunity to expand what theater can do. The reason I fell in love with theater because I grew up as a PK, which is a preacher's kid, and it's very much like the same congregation that I had on Sunday service, walking into a theater space with people you don't know and not worshiping a spirit, but being overcome and, and washed over with a story. It's very parallel to the church. And so I think our church needs to change. And I think these new seven black plays coming in is the beginning of that change that our congregations can look more like the world we actually live in. So I think, I think theater is a power, it's a tool. It's something that can affect change. It can make people think and not just entertain. And I'm specifically interested in the, in the future of my career and bringing stories that pull in the everyday experience and give them light and give them levity and give them space and, and let them know they're deserving. So I think coming back right now is saying we belong. All of our stories belong and the theater will be better for it. And so I'm just very excited that 48 hours from now or so we will be bringing some joy to Midtown. Um, I was in the lobby yesterday during tech and I ran into this black auntie. She had to be maybe mid 60s. And I said, I'm the playwright. I just want to say to you, I'm really happy to see you here. She said, no, honey, you'll be happy when I bring my friends. And I said, well, OK, let's go. Let's go, auntie. You know, and, and that kind of change is what excites me about coming back, is that people that I grew up with will also share the space that I love. And we'd love to to hear uh, from from Lynn on the on this same question about about. Thank you. I'm also really happy to be in this space with these good folks and to be coming back to theater after this incredibly long pause, which really taught me how much I loved and crave theater and crave community. And I echo everything that Antoinette and Douglas said. I think one of the things that we really love about theater most is the fact that it's community, that as storytellers, our stories aren't really complete until our final collaborators sit in those seats who are the audience and help us fill in all of those blanks with their laughter and their tears and their joy and all of those things that happen. You know, we have to remember that theater really was developed as a space for catharsis, as a space for us to release what we're going through. And over the last four years, we've gone four or five years, we've gone through a lot. I mean, from Trump to the endless stream of indignities that were committed against um, black bodies, you know, to to COVID and, and on to this cultural reckoning, there is a lot that we need to process. And I really feel that there is this urgency now for people to get back into spaces communally and do that. I mean, as, as theater artists, we are cultural watchdogs and we're processors and we're disruptors. But ultimately, I think we also also play a role in healing. And I think that when people come to the theater, they're looking for some glorious form of release, you know, and that's one of the reasons that I, I think I wrote Clyde's because I was processing all of the bevy of complicated emotions that um, were going through my body and were beginning to metastasize. And I thought I have to release them. And I released them onto the page and in something that I feel is soulful and funny and healing that's really about the resurrection of spirit and ultimately about joy. I, I, I love those responses because part of the reason that I that I asked you that was that I felt from you know from all three of you that part of the journey is and you all mentioned this word joy and you mentioned black joy, you mentioned cleansing, you mentioned healing. Uh, and I think so often you know when we think of theater, obviously people think of just simple entertainment. Uh, other people, um, they think of plays that are tragedies, you know, of course, catharsis is part of that. But, and when I feel like in, in a lot of your work, um, there is obviously pain and transformation, but then also joy and affirmation and the strength of spirit, 
Um, Doug, that's very much apparent in Chicken and Biscuits uh, for these people that are going through so much on a day of a funeral. And Antoinette, obviously with this, the new ending, and as, as you spoke about Passover, um, and, and so, you know, I, I'm really interested in this idea that, you know, the journey that you're taking us on is one of joy and affirmation and love, which I, I think is wonderful. And, you know, what I want to talk about next is the, the way that you engage with that. Um, and so, you know, obviously with tradition and not just traditional forms, but, and I want to keep this question with Lynn, you know, for MJ, the musical, uh, you know, you as a writer are, uh, working with or collaborating with this tradition, this sort of almost mythical tradition of Michael Jackson and the music and, um, you know, how you, you know, how you grapple with that in, in the storytelling of, you know, using that as part of your storytelling, but also with, with your own voice, which I, I, I would love to hear. Um, sure. I mean, it's really one of the biggest challenges of writing MJ is that you're um, in conversation with someone who was a genius, someone who um, was flawed, someone who was a perfectionist. You know, when we're saying we're trying to cast Michael Jackson, we're joking. It's like, how do you find someone who is a triple threat? Because if they're triple threat, they'd already be a star like um, My Michael Jackson. I do think that we found someone. But I, but I think what we decided to do when we're writing the musical is really lean into the thing that we love most about Michael, which is his music and his creativity and his imagination and try and decipher, you know, what are all of those ingredients and elements that um, came together in such a way to make this person one of the biggest stars in the world and also one of the most complicated and flawed and fraught stars in, in the entire world. It's incredible because it, that's obviously a, a, a huge task. Yeah. Uh, with with all of his work and so I want to send this question uh, next to Antoinette at, about tradition because Passover you're dealing with uh, the Bible you're dealing with Samuel Beckett you're dealing with a lot of other things so I'd be curious to hear as you create as you're making this new work how you also are grappling with or using tradition and or surpassing tradition I think uh, could even be the case. Yeah, no, that's a great question. No, it's so funny over this whole press process, people keep saying, when did you write Passover? As though there's a date when you start, you know? And talking about tradition and talking about where those two er texts came from, it was really from my life. I mean, I love that Douglas talked about the church and yes, I grew up in the church as well. The only tweak for me is that I did not grow up in what we consider the traditional black church. So, you know, the, the dancing in the aisles and the chorus and the, and the call and response, I have never experienced that a day in my life. I grew up in a church that was very conservative. So on one hand, I, you know, and I was, I was taught um, creationism as fact as a child that I believed wholeheartedly. I was taught about the literal existence of hell. So I grew up believing that the earth was 6,000 years old and I have this earth text of the Moses story that was handed to me as this is an example of how you get to know God. And this is something that's in my foundational identity and my foundational understanding of the world. And then of course, as many people do, you leave the church, but you still have this promised land view of time and history. And then you go to college and you read Waiting for Godot and I'm already deeply in love with Beckett at this point. And I'm like, God, you know, Godot, God, but the person who holds supreme power in this play, he left them in the wilderness. He never, they're wandering in the wilderness. The wilderness is their conversation. And that's just in your mind, in your DNA. And then the, called to the adventure of writing the play is the anguish of this murderer, George Zimmerman being let go. And so you look back in your, and you're like, okay, as a black person who is also an American, when am I gonna get to the promised land of just being a full human in my own country? Being a citizen. Thank you, Claudia Rank Rankine. When am I gonna get there? because I'm paying my taxes. 
I'm keeping the law. I don't have a, you know, I'm being as respectable as a black person can be. When am I gonna get there? Oh, does the promised land exist? Cause Moses said it did, but Beckett said it doesn't. Okay, let's go. That's the start. And I don't know what day that was, <laughs> but that's how it all mushes together. And like Lynn said, you've got to process. I have to process what it means when George Zimmerman, a citizen has the right to kill a young man, a citizen. I'm a citizen. Does that mean that every white person I know has the right to kill me? Does it? Because I got to pay my taxes next April 15th. And I don't know, I think this is a little bit of a bum deal. Okay, I got to write a play about it. There you go. And I think we, we, we feel that in your ending, the sense of, you know, you sort of said Beckett doesn't go far enough. And then you kind of drive right past him, which I think is, is, is really fantastic. And, you know, part of what I'm hearing here with this idea of faith, and I want to send this back to Doug because Chicken and Biscuits um, takes place and it's at a funeral. And so we have the sense of death and uh, there's a, uh, I don't want to give too much away, but, uh, you know, there's a song that happens in the play. Um, and also, and, and it struck me in, in one of one of the characters actually cites Second Corinthians and says this idea of we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. So um, I would love to um, ask Doug about that in the sense of faith being a uh, tradition, faith being a place that can create community, but then what are, are the limits of that at the same time and placing the faith in the unseen versus making that, that new ending, if, if that makes any sense. For sure, I actually think writing itself is faith, right? Writing that someone will understand what you're trying to say, writing that you will get through this story and know what you wanted to say. Um, writing, because we spend a lot of time alone with an idea that may or may not land, it may or may not articulate itself. Um, so that's a, a form of faith. I was raised in the church, as I said, and I grew up with a lot of ideals that were given to me. Now, some of the doctrine I do not agree with and I do not support, but I was able to take the love out of the Bible and find the goodness in my heart based on the teachings that were given to me very young. Um, and because there is that parallel in faith and in performance in church, because there is a performance uh, arena to the black church, um, that felt very theatrical in itself. And so, I'm always trying to investigate how do people behave every day based on what they believe to be true? And how does that clash, right? Some people are staunch Christians and they stand on that Bible and that is how they dictate their actions. But that doesn't mean it makes them a better person. Some people have nothing but their dreams, but their actions are more godly than those that claim to be godly. Right. And so when you mush all of that together, what does that make? Like, what what do we find about the human condition when we take religion and we we investigate it? And so I think the play is doing a bit of that because you have eight different characters. Uh, Michael, you replace Logan, who is a very Jewish neurotic character who has never been to a black church, who does not understand what's going on throughout the service. You have people who were brought up and have left you have you know a young queer man who feel like he doesn't belong there um but wants to hold on to his family and how complex religion can mystify the human condition but also encourage and celebrate it as well it's a very very difficult thing that i've told with growing up um which is why i think i wrote the play to try to figure out how can i have the love that i was taught but in a way that really speaks and doesn't harm people. And so I think Chicken and Biscuits is that mosh pit of ideas and the clash of the ugly and the gorgeous and how faith can hurt, but also heal. I think that's, that's fascinating because the church is obviously a sort of separate space, which can sometimes provide more or less protections from society that it runs alongside. Um, and I wanna bring this back to Lynn um, about Clyde's. Uh, so you have these characters that were uh, formerly incarcerated, uh, and you know how they're 
uh, coming back into a, a, a different world, right? So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about that. And obviously working off the, the description of that, but of those characters in that play, because I feel like that's probably um, that's probably part of the, the theme. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and just by way of a little more description is that it takes place in this strange limo space, which is a truck stop on, you know, a, on a, a, an old truck route. And it's a sandwich shop in which, as you say, this group of formerly incarcerated folks work because it's the only place that they can actually find jobs because of the nature of what they've done and who they are. And so one of the questions of, in, of the play is, you know, are they in limbo? Are they st uh, stuck between heaven and hell? But when I was thinking uh, about writing the play, I was thinking a lot about mindfulness and the Japanese concept of wabi-sabi, which is really finding the simple beauty in things that are um, not quite perfect and finding the beauty in things that may be perceived as broken, but can be repaired in ways that invites us to contemplate them um, from different angles and different perspectives. And I think that that's really um, why I've written this play is inviting the audience to contemplate these characters who may be perceived as broken um, in an entirely different way. And I use food as a metaphor for creativity, but also I'm really interested in the way in which ingredients can be combined. Um, basically, simple ingredients can be in com co combined in different ways and have um, different outcomes and have different offerings. And so th that's really foundational um, to what the play is and why I wrote the play. And it is simple because it is about mindfulness. And so I didn't want to overcomplicate it, but really I wanted the play to be a form of meditation. Um, you talk about why you invite audiences in, you know, often we're inviting people in just to laugh or to cry for some of the very basic reasons. But I wanted also people to be invited to a space in which by the end they have realized that they've been in the process of meditating on what it means to be human, what it means to be creative, and how does one move through all of those things to find um, um, spiritual resurrection. And, I, and you, you mentioned like a, a liminal space or sort of like a purgatory, which obviously has a lot of parallels with Passover and even a, even a church as in chicken and biscuits. And so I'd love to just add, have you talk a little bit more about um, and this is sort of related to community and theater of of what that kind of space does for us as an audience and you know why you chose that because obviously it's a truck stop but then you also mentioned that it's functioning otherwise so i'd love to hear more about that well you know it's it's when i was read, writing clyde's i was really thinking about the process of creative creativity and douglas doug, doug was saying that you know writing is an act of faith and writing is a spiritual act and i thought how can i translate what i'm feeling and what this process is onto the stage so that you know the audience can be in conversation not just with the story but actual actual process of making art which, as, as I mentioned, is, is told through the assembling of sandwiches. You know, Montrellis, who is sort of, quote unquote, the Buddha from the hood, while well, he's making sandwiches, he's also dispensing wisdom and trying to get these people who are um, spiritually fragmented to see themselves as whole. And I, I think perhaps that is the biggest conversation that I want to have for the audiences, because I think coming out of COVID and coming out of this moment of re reckoning, we all are feeling spiritually and emotionally fragmented and incomplete and um, may not think that we have the tools to reconstitute self. And it's not that the play offers the solution or the answer, but it, sh it shows people who are grappling with the same things. So that that audience, while they're sitting there and feeling incomplete, can think, oh, you know what? I kind of relate. And they can soak in all of that wisdom of Montrellis and by the end feel perhaps a little tiny bit better. I, I, I that, that's fantastic because I, when you're talking about being as, as a writer, and what it, it tells me is, is also the power of words. So, you know, we have actors in the space, but the power of your words and your wor words interpreted by the actors to bring this about, to create this change, to bring about the spiritual transformation. So, I, you know, I, I would love to now come back to Antoinette and, and, and talk about, um, as, as a playwright, uh, your use of language. Uh, and what I want to add to this is that I feel like sometimes you could also say that playwrights are, are composers in a way as well. When we sit in the theater, 
uh, even if we didn't speak the language, that we hear a sound, we hear a rhythm. Um, so I and, and we definitely hear that in in Passover. Uh, so I would love to hear about that. Really, as as a writer, in the sense of aesthetics and the pure uh, power of the words themselves and the sound. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, the 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 way that Passover, the sound of Passover came was through great conflict and, and sort of a daily or at least monthly question that I had to ask myself while I was teaching as an adjunct and then later as a full-time uh, non-tenure track, full-time six course a semester, six in the fall, five in the spring, never go back. I if you're gonna do that much teaching, at least get tenure. Um, I had to make a decision every single semester. I was teaching public speaking, which is a required course for BMCC students. I am who I am and I look the way I look. I was about 10 years younger when I started. So every time I'd walk into the class and I had long locks, right? They were very long. So every time I'd walk into the class, my students thought I was another student. And then I would use that as a thing like, ha ha ha, no, I'm the teacher and I'm gonna teach you how to speak. We're gonna have to, you have to give four speeches in my, five speeches in my class. And I'm teaching kids who look very much like and sound very much like Moses and Kitsch, right? I'm a Harvard educated, two master's degree, dark skinned black woman. I know how to speak the English that the majority culture has taught me to speak. And I'm teaching young people to talk about themselves for 90 seconds and then for two minutes, you know, these speech, you know, teach us how to actually one of the teachers was one of the speeches was a how to and a lot of people teach us how to make a sandwich, teach us how to make your favorite food, teach us how to make your grandmother's best dish that can be a speech for two minutes you're teaching us how to do it. Time and time again, you begin to open up a person's heart, you begin to open up their mind, you begin to give them a space where they can speak. They're going to break the rules they're getting so into the speech, they might say the N word. You know, they're getting feedback from their classmates. Yeah, and you know, and then they get into it and they're animated. So time and time again, it's the question, okay, am I gonna stand up for the institution which says that I have to grade these students based on a specific rubric of speech? You cannot say the N word in a class. Come on kids, this is college. Or am I gonna grade students based on, wow, you did, you did a, what I wanted you to do, which is you spoke clearly, authentically. You did not shame or harm anyone in the class while you were doing this. Now I'm saying I'm doing this for eight years. And I become seduced by the language of my own students. And my relationship with the N-word becomes very ambivalent. I'm like, I hear authenticity. I don't, no one in the classroom is shamed. Yes, we did have a few situations. We had one situation where a young uh, white man from Staten Island thought he could in his speech about rap and his favorite rapper say this word. And it was a great discussion afterwards. Who can say it, who cannot? Because you're teaching students how to speak. That just found its way into my work. Their language, their rhythm, my acceptance of their language and their rhythm as their authentic speech. All of the words that they did not have for their feelings for one another as students because a semester is the exact wrong length of time if you wanna build a relationship. It's just enough time to say, hey, I really wanna to get to know that person and then the class is over. You know what I mean? So the language and the music, it's like I had to, I had to just listen to my own students and say, yeah, no, that's not bad. They're speaking to me in their music and I accept it. And I can give an A to anybody I want to, I don't care, but you know what I mean? The rubric at the end of the day, it's like, I don't care. I give you an A because you spoke to me. So that's, that's how the music comes to you. And then it's like, can I, can I reverence it and can I recreate it? And can I do so without making it appropriative or without making it um, cliche? What I hear, what I hear in that also is this idea of kind of an authorial voice. Uh, when you take voices or different types of speaking from different places, and and you're writing a play and you're allowing all these people to speak, but you're also the one, the one who is speaking as as the author. Uh, but I'd love to send this to to Douglas now um, to talk about this because I feel like. Uh, this uh, Douglas's play is probably a great example of when you can see a play and you also hear a play and the vibrance of the language and talking about joy. I feel like that really 
uh, comes out in the language. So I'd, I'd love to hear more about that process of, of crafting what to me is, is really much a, a sound as much as it is a text. For sure. I think, you know, so I grew up in New Haven, Connecticut. My mother is from Oriental, North Carolina, which is right off the coast. Um, maybe the town's only 10 miles long or something like that. <clears throat> but there's a difference in the way that folks from New Haven would speak and folks down south would speak. So when I was growing up, I had a nickname only in the south. They called me Gooch for about like four years. I don't know why. I don't know what was very Gooch about me, but they called me Gooch. Gooch, come here, Gooch. Hey, and you know, my, my cousin's um, nickname was Flounder, but we only had them in the South. Um, so the, the spectrum of blackness runs the gamut on how we speak, what words we choose to use given where we are, and when we're around, you know, different company, what words or what drag is put on or what high voice is put, how are you? You know, that changes. And I think there's comedy in that, which Chicken and Biscuits explores. But also, Chicken and Biscuits is an opportunity to honor the beauty of our language as is, of our reverence as is, of our shade, you know, how, how a woman may be dressed in her church hat, but comment on your titties, right? Like, what is the comedy in that? And I'm so excited to bring the vernacular and the style and the comedy and the beauty that I grew up with, which is not language that you necessarily hear every day. We have a Gen Z character who has a mixtape and she is spitting it for you, you know? That is, she deserves to be on stage. And she may not speak like your traditional Broadway character, but she exists in the world, therefore she deserves the space. And, and black people talk a certain way. That some black people use the N-word. I don't specifically, but some people do, right? And it's understanding and unpacking what is beneath it. Why is it being used? What does it mean to that community, right? It may sound a certain way to you, but it may be protection or love to them. And, and really giving space for that language to be what it needs to be for that community and you to have a better understanding of what it is because you were there to witness it. So the next time you hear it, you don't judge it necessarily. If you see a girl with 22 inch braids, multicolored and she's bopping, that you don't judge her, but you maybe listen to her. And if we all listen a little bit differently, we may understand each other the better. And I think the theater can be that way to allow people to have access to different communities that they don't understand. So, I think Chicken and Biscuits has a lot of a lot of fun with that. Yeah. And uh, I'd love to send this back to Antoinette, who uh, has a has a follow up to that. Yes, 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 yes. And I just wanted to follow up and say, just to end my thought on that and and my relationship specifically with the N word, I would say, but also with the language that you find in Passover. This last June literally June that just happened, I was in Los Angeles and I had the best conversation with my aunt Stephanie, where I'm telling her about the play and I'm like, I'm about to go on Broadway, da 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 And we're sitting in the backyard of my grandmother's house. And I was like, yeah, you know, my relationship with the N-word, da-da-da, and I have to put it in this play and da-da-da-da. And my aunt starts cackling. And she was like, that's not just at BMCC, girl. Who are we? You were rehearing the language you grew up with from the age of 12 to the age of 36. Primarily white institution, primarily white institution, primarily white, you know what I mean? Yes, what Douglas said, you can put on a drag for so long you think it's you. And then you hear a language that seduces you and gets you back home. I just had to add that. What I hear that is that you part of this process is that you know Douglas was saying you're 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 putting these characters on stage that speak a certain way that are encouraging you then to hear and listen in a different way in the real world, but you're also you know you're you're accessing even some of your own history is was what I heard in that and you're rediscovering it, um, and again you know because we're we're talking you know about about playwriting here and I I, I want to also then I want to go back to Lynn on this because uh, I know your play Intimate Apparel was inspired by rediscovering uh, part of your own history. I know for Ruined, 
you did quite a bit of research um, and you know probably for a lot of your plays and to to hear about that also in the writing process so as much as it's about yourself and your voice and discovering that rediscovering that uh the elements of research involved i think i would be great for people to hear when you're also learning about a totally other different kind of person that you want to put in your play sure that's a really interesting question and um, I, I think a lot about that because I think um, research is really foundational to my art pr practice. But one of the things that Barbara Jordan said is that when she was asked, you know, why do you speak this way or why, you know, do you lean in this direction? She said, you know, I am a black woman and so my issues are always in the room even if they sound like they're not. And <laughs> Um, I, I think that it's always foundational to my writing, but that said, I have this incredibly nomadic imagination. I think as an artist, I'm really um, interested in cultural collisions. I'm interested in the nature of multiculturalism in our country because it's the thing that causes the greatest tension right now. And as such, um, as, an, as an artist, I go out into the world in, in hunt of stories that I think that will resonate for everyone, which means sometimes I'm in dialogue with people who are very different from myself. And I have to figure out how do I find their cadences and how do I, you know, how do I identify who they are and digging deep through recording them and researching them and spending a lot of time with them when I was writing Sweat, I spent two and a half years in Reading, Pennsylvania, interviewing as many people as possible from the mayor of the city, who was the first African-American mayor <laughs> to get elected, you know, to people in, in the forest who were living in a large unhoused encampment um, and just recording them and, and trying to figure out what is the story here that, that needs to be told. And Sweat is the story that came out of that, but also um, Clyde's. You know, Clyde's came out of my research when um, because a lot of the people who I was speaking to were formerly incarcerated because one of the things that people don't know is that Reading, Pennsylvania is lo located rather centrally in Pennsylvania and for a long period of time, you know, it was a mill town and an industrial town and an agricultural town and people coming out of prison and could get off a bus and almost immediately find jobs and this was true for decades decades and then during the economic downturn this completely stopped but the prison system continued to use Reading as a dumping ground and so folks were coming and had no opportunity and so a lot of the people who I spoke to were folks who had literally been dumped into the city and didn't know what to do with themselves and um, they were folks who were as far away from me as possible. You know, I'm this Brooklyn girl from New York City, you know, who went to these Ivy League schools, who, um, yes, I had many of my families who had been incarcerated and I'm very intimate on some level with the prison system, but I was not necessarily familiar with the kind of struggles that they were grappling with in that moment. And so finding that language and finding their ca cadences and finding those emotions became this excavation um, project that I found really interesting. And I always think of my research and my procrastination as part of my art practice. I, I think that's wonderful because then your interest in these other people, you bring that to audiences and hopefully you make them more interested in other people and other types of people too. And that's part of, I think, the work that you're doing for, for audiences is that you're expanding our view of, you know, as, as audiences, we procrastinate um, we go to see a play and then it's going to open our minds up to these other people. And that's that's part of what you're you're doing for us, which I, I think is fantastic. Um, I wanted to let the audience know that we're going to we can take some questions in the Q&A box uh, as we're going to look towards wrapping up. Um, so as you send in your questions, uh, what I want to ask, and this is following up on Lynn, you said the fact that um, that you're a black woman is always in the room, even as you're writing about these other these other things. So. Um, you know, but you also, and, and as you are incredibly creative, uh, and I think you said nomadic was a word, um, and that you, you know, different genres and different types of people. So I would love to hear from each of you just specifically on that question. Um, you sort of the fact of who you are is always in the room. 
Uh, but you know, you are incredibly creative people that have access to so many different things in yourselves and in your spirit, but also in the spirit of people around you and the fact that you research and you listen and you collate other experiences. So I, that's sort of a contradiction in a way. And I, I'd love to hear about that contradiction and, and how, you, how you feel about that, of being someone as a writer who you can write anything, you're creative, you know, let's go see the play because it's by Lynn Nottage. What's it about? Well, she's amazing. So let's just go see it. Um, you know, so I'd, I'd love to hear uh, about that from, from each of you. Wait, I'm sorry. I would just love a tiny bit of clarification because you said the clash. Oh, the, the clash, clash between, between being able to write anything, but then what's the other side of it? Oh, and then the the fact that Lynn said, you know, the fact that she's a black woman is always in the room, and so you know, it's like, do you always have to write about that, or you can write about anything, or is it both, or either, or is my question nonsense? <laughs> I it, I it, think it, respectfully, it, your question yeah. is a tiny bit of nonsense. <laughs> okay, that's good. I'm I'm happy with that. Well, that's what we want to hear. Yeah, yeah. Because I think because that, I think yeah. that okay, I, and okay. Yeah. Your no, question is a tiny bit of nonsense to me. A, because I am a black woman who is also the vessel for the text. I will write about anything I so choose, and it filters through my black womanness. It filters through the fact that I'm a Pisces sun, Libra moon, Cancer rising. It filters through the fact that I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California, which is a strange, strange place to grow up as a black person. Can I just tell you all the conversation that I had with one of the matriarchs of my family when I first started learning about civil rights at school? And I was like, mom, you know, not my, it was not my mom. I was like, grandma, civil rights, civil rights. And I was like, what did you do during the civil rights? And I got to write my black play, civil rights. And she was like, that was what we left behind. I watched them in words on TV. And then I turned the TV off. So that's going to be my civil rights play. Like, I don't get the mountaintop. I, you know what I mean? So it's filtered through my experience. That is in the room, even if I never write my civil rights play. So if I write a play tomorrow about flamingos, I don't know. The fact that that's my relationship with civil rights is still in the room. I am the filter for the text. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does make sense. And just to add to that, I remember many, many years ago having a, a professor um, who had invited another speaker to the class. And the speaker, who, who was Ramyas Lini, who was at the time a very famous playwright, you know, he was talking about how fundamentally playwriting is really about processing your, um, your family. And I thought, oh, that's bullshit, that's not true, you know, it's about so much more. But what I really think um, now that I'm older is that ultimately that is what we are doing is we're processing the relationships that we have um, in the world. And the primary relationship is really with our, fa our family, that foundational um, relationship is with our family. But the storytelling comes in the way in which we tell those stories of our family through metaphor. Yeah, and to, and to add to that, I think I have healed myself of some personal trauma by writing these stories. I, there are things that I could not say to my parents that I've said in the play. And they've seen the play, and the play has started a conversation that we've thus healed, or we're healing actively. Um, and so I enjoy writing anything I don't like being boxed in, you know, that you're black and you're queer and so you have to write this narrative. I have a musical called The Moon and the Sea that I'm a part of and I've written, you know, an overbearing Jewish mother, Deborah. I love her. I'm not a Jewish woman. I ask people, you know, are these references correct? And my very Jewish friend was like, you nailed that. That's my mom. And I was like, OK, because if I can lock into the personality and the heartbeat of these characters, I will always honor through research. So I'm very much like, I just want to write anything. You know, I have an actor musician piece that when people see it, they will assume it was written by a white man. It wasn't, but I love that. I love that creativity does not have to have an image attached to it to land. Um, 
and that's very exciting for me. Yeah, and it's it's also really about finding your way into those characters. I remember years ago when I was writing Ruin, which is a, which is a play about gender specific human rights abuses in the Congo, and um, I thought, how am I going to tell these stories about these women who have been through very specific kind of trauma that is not. Um, um, familiar to me, that is foreign to me. And I remember I had taken a picture with this group of women and I was wearing this very beautiful colorful boo-boo which was similar to the ones they were wearing. And it was the old days back when you got film processed. So I didn't see the film you know, for like a month after the trip. And when I was looking at all these photographs, I didn't notice that I was in them at all. And that became um, the way that I entered the stories. I realized I'm not telling their story, I'm telling my own story and using their story as a way to process my own trauma and to journey through my experiences of, of, of you know, feeling abused and feeling marginalized. Well, to follow up on, on, on that as well, I, I, we have a question from the audience and I think this segues us nicely into um, you know, this question of creativity and, and what do you want to write, what, what can you write? And then how do you feel? Um, so the question is, a theme of this conversation has been about the different communities and congregations that you belong to. What are your thoughts about how you feel located in the Broadway community, if there is such a thing, or now it's a new thing? Um, so that's, we'd love to hear about that and your experience in, in that as you have a show opening, um, you know, about to open, opened already. I'll speak quickly. So I've been a part of the Broadway community as an actor for a decade now. And so I feel very familiar with the space, but obviously this is a new position. Um, but I don't feel the pressure. I feel an ease. I feel a covering. We've been talking about a covering in our room that we're going to be okay. And it feels like an opportunity to break open a door to show that our stories are as relatable and as human as any other. So I'm excited. I'm not taking on any pressure. I don't care about an award. I'm here to, to bring in the black aunties and the little cousins into this space and for them to cry, heal, and then go have chicken and biscuits. That's what the task is. It is not to impress or to be allowed or to be um, embraced. It's here to take up space and to celebrate our joy, which rarely gets seen at this level. So I'm, I'm pumped. Let's do it. That's that's my attitude right now. I, oh, no. no I, I, can I just add uh, quickly is that the Broadway community reconstitutes itself every single year based on the plays um, that are part of the season. And I think one of the beautiful things about this particular season is that there's so much company and that it's going to feel very different. The, the audience coming in is going to be different. The conversations about theater are going to be different. So I'm looking forward to it because back when I was doing Sweat, I felt very invisible and I felt very marginalized and I felt very frustrated. And going into this season, it feels entirely different. I feel, you know, much greater sense of entitlement and also um, an ownership of the space. I'm going to take up more space this time than I did last time in which I felt like, um, um, uh, yeah, where, where I felt marginalized. Yeah, that's a great <laughs> segue. I, I'm so glad you all spoke first, actually, because what I was going to say sounds bonkers. Um, I know myself to be the new mayor of Broadway. I just don't know if anybody else knows it yet. <laughs> I opened it. I now have the beautiful job of just, you know, my rehearsal room is done. My press is winding down. Now I get to see every other show. And in this weird way, welcome every other show to Broadway where I have been. So I don't know about, you know, the Broadway of the past. I was an apprentice writer, an off-Broadway writer for the last five, 10 years. You know, that has been my community. And I would, when you get the money or the comp or the get, plus one, you go see a Broadway show because that's something that you also have to do. And that has been my relationship to Broadway. I was a Tony voter last year I am one this year. So that was great because I got to actually see a lot more shows. I was like, oh, right, Broadway exists. I get to see those shows. So I, you know, because of the historic nature of this moment, I've been given an opportunity and I feel a little bit like Robin Hood, you know, come on here, steal this moment and then take it back into my own 
uh, into my own community, but the community of Passover Broadway has been and continues to be just some of the most courageous, beautiful, creative, innovative people that I have ever had a chance to work with. And I'm so, 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 so proud of every single one of us because we were spitting in tubes. We were doing press when it was our first day back. We were, you know, talking to cameramen saying, yeah, I have not spoken face to face with someone else for 18 months, but let's sit down and do this interview. Is it mask on, mask off? Are you vaccinated? Yes, yes, yes. So we were out there in the hinterlands when a lot of Broadway was not even in town yet. And that's my community. And I love those people so, so, so much. And for everybody else, welcome. I'm the mayor and I'll see y'all at the show. <laughs> I'll see y'all at the show. I, that's wonderful. I, I feel like everyone had a, a you know very positive take on that. So I just want to push this is the last question for everybody, but I want to just push you a little bit further and say, well, then what's what else needs to happen? What do you still want to see? What what needs what you know, that's like to sort of speak to the change. Uh, what next? What else? That's that's kind of what I what I want to ask you for what from what you what you see. What next is I need to go back and talk to every economist I can to figure out how to make going to a Broadway show consistently as affordable for working class communities as going to the movies. That's my next job. I don't know how to do it. I don't understand economics, but I want people who work every day to be able to see a Broadway show for $40. That's why we picked the price. If you're, on, if you're in Times Square and you go to AMC or Regal and you need two tickets, it's $40. If you go to the August Wilson Theater and you need one ticket, okay, I'm trying, but one ticket, it's $40. Because I don't care what we're doing inside if the tickets are not affordable to me, to my people, then they're not gonna see it. And those lotteries are stressful because I've never won a Hamilton lottery. It's stressful. So if I work for seven years for a show that's about you, then I need you to be able to see it. Yeah, that's just to, to echo what Antoinette said is like, how do you make theater accessible for everyone? But also how do you make this moment, this historic moment sustainable so that it's not just um, a little blip and which, you know, you had seven black plays and, you know, the audiences didn't come. And I think one of that, that ways is, is building the muscle, not just on stage, but backstage, is building muscle in the marketing, in the advertising, you know, and the people who are making the wigs and the, the people who are pulling the levers is ensuring that the theater community in a, a completely holistic and beautiful way reflects what is being seen on the stage. And so I think that we have a lot of work to do um, to build our community so that it is reflective of the world that we live in. There are young black and brown kids who sing and dance and act and dream, and they don't know that the theater exists for them. I was one of them until I was 16. I had sang all my life in church. I had danced and tapped and taught but I didn't know what musical theater was called as an art form until my senior year in high school. And I went, oh, there's a thing for me. We have to reach out, go beyond the money that we can make and let people know they are welcomed into this space. And I guarantee you in a decade from now, the theater will look differently. But just because you can make money off the same audiences from last year doesn't mean you're doing the job. Doesn't mean we're doing the work. So we have to extend our hands wider if we really want change. And you may lose a little money, but a lot of Broadway doesn't always make money anyway. So that's not an excuse, right? I think there's an adjustment to be made if we expand our minds and go a little bit wider. That's the change, that's the future. That's, it's it's amazing. I think that each each one of you is expanding the minds of audiences. Uh, I think each one of you has done incredible work and will keep doing incredible work. And I encourage everyone watching this to see your plays, uh, to see them a second time, uh, <laughs> to see them maybe a third time, uh, to catch everything, to, um, to keep going to plays, to keep going to Broadway. It's back, it's really safe, it's really comfortable. It's, 
it's it's wonderful. Um, and thank you so much each for being here, uh, Lynn, Douglas, Antoinette, um, for your thoughts, for your genius and brilliance shared with us and 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 with each other and with audiences um, that that can that can see your shows. So. Thanks a lot, and um, I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. This was good for the mind. Yes, it was. <laughs> have a great yeah. day. All Take right. care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.